This is a pre-course video for the Difficult Vascular Access in Children course. I'll be talking about the technical aspects of IV cannulation. My name is Tom Beamer. I'm a radiology registrar working at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals and I have an interest in interventional radiology. You should already have watched the video on setup and vein selection, so I will only briefly touch on these points if they are relevant to the content of this video. This video is aimed at intermediate or experienced IV cannulators who succeed most of their IV cannulation attempts, but occasionally find themselves missing and unsure why. I was in a similar position a couple of years ago and found it helpful to go back to first principles and consider what is happening to the device and the vein at each step of the cannulation procedure, which brings me to the objectives. Firstly, I'll cover the anatomy of the cannula, including the different variations you may encounter in clinical practice and how they may be relevant to your technique, including what the different flashbacks indicate. Secondly, I will take you through some technique tips, including how and why to maintain skin tension, the importance of insertion angle, and in my opinion, the optimal way to grip a cannula. Thirdly, I will cover the only three ways I believe it's possible to fail a cannula and how they can be avoided with the knowledge and technique tips we will have covered. Lastly, I will touch upon something I believe to be very important, the situations in which an IV cannula may not be the most appropriate way forward for your patient. There are a few different varieties of cannula that you will encounter in practice with some key differences that may impact your technique. As a minimum, every cannula will have some tubing connected to a port for IV administration, also known as the cannula itself, and an introducer needle connected to a flashback chamber, which is usually clear, to allow you to puncture the vessel and know you're in place. Things variably present on different cannulas are the extra IV administration port seen on top in this diagram and side wings, which may not always be present, especially in a paediatric setting. So my advice is to develop a technique which doesn't rely on these features. There are a couple of other features which don't make as big a difference to insertion technique, such as the presence or absence of a valve to stop blood spillage, just make sure to compress the vein near the cannula tip when removing the needle in non-valved versions. The other is that most modern cannulas will have a needle safety mechanism where the sharp is covered once you withdraw the needle fully so you won't be able to reinsert the needle. Common cannula gauges used in clinical practice run from 26 to 14 gauge in increasing size. And you'll have to adapt your technique depending which gauge of cannula you're using. The reason for this isn't necessarily because of the overall length and diameter increase, though of course larger diameters are more difficult to puncture skin with, but more because of the distance between the needle and the start of the cannula tubing, which has to be accounted for with all cannulas, but can vary significantly between the smallest and largest gauges being only around 2 mm in a 22 gauge blue cannula and up to around 7 mm in a 14 gauge orange cannula. It's worth knowing that the gauge system for needles is archaic and the numbers don't relate logically to the dimensions of the needle, unlike French gauge which refers to external diameter for example. The main thing to bear in mind when selecting a cannula is that there's an exponential drop-off in maximum infusion rate as you decrease in size. You can see from the table that under gravity, a litre of fluid can be infused in around four minutes through an orange cannula. The same litre takes over 11 minutes through a green cannula, despite the fact that they're both on the larger end of the cannula spectrum. There are two separate flashbacks which people talk about during IV cannulation. And if we consider our knowledge of how a cannula is put together, they become easy to interpret. The first flashback is when we are advancing our intact cannula towards the vessel 
and blood starts to flow up the central introducer needle and into the chamber at the back of the cannula. What this first flashback means is that our needle tip has breached a vessel wall at some point during the procedure, which if you're paying attention and advancing in a controlled enough manner, means the needle tip should be somewhere within a vein. What first flashback doesn't give us any information on is where the cannula tubing is sat within that vein. Hence, a common way to fail a cannula is to interpret first flashback as a sign that you need to advance the cannula off the needle straight away. As you can see from the simple diagrams above, first flashback has been achieved in both cases, but the cannula tubing is not within the vein lumen and attempting to advance it off the needle will result in a failed cannulation. Second flashback is less useful when getting into the vessel in the first place, but is a nice confirmation that you are where you need to be and it represents blood filling up the cannula tubing as you withdraw the introducer needle. A quick public service announcement at this point. IV cannulation is an invasive procedure which is not risk-free to the operator or the patient. You should practice aseptic non-touch technique, including appropriate hand washing, working with a clean tray or field, and appropriate skin preparation. Safe handling and disposal of sharps should also be considered before and throughout the procedure. It's worth familiarising yourself with your hospital's policy for sharp safety and aseptic non-touch technique. The first thing to do once you've selected a vein, insertion site, got into a comfortable position and prepped the skin is to apply skin tension in such a way that you can maintain the tension throughout the procedure. This is normally done with your non-dominant hand distal to the chosen insertion site, and I personally use my thumb to apply the skin traction. With children, you can even have whoever your helper is, be it the parent, play specialist or healthcare assistant, apply some light skin tension in the opposite direction, as seen in the accompanying picture. Enough skin tension can straighten out curvy veins to make them a viable target, and also avoid the situation we often encounter in older patients, with poor connective tissue, of the vein being extremely mobile underneath the skin. Take a look at this video as an example. Some of you may be happy attempting this hand vein cannulation as it is, but I'm sure you'll agree, once proper skin tension has been applied, it looks like a lovely straight target. The biggest mistake I tend to see regarding insertion angle is being nowhere near flat enough when it comes to advancing the cannula. Proximal veins dive deeper into the muscles of the upper arm and are sometimes an exception to this, but this statement rings true 95% of the time. The benefits of shallow angle of advance become clear when you think about what's happening between getting your first flashback and threading the cannula off the introducer needle. Here we see two examples of a vein in cross section with a cannula at the point of first flashback. In the left-hand picture, the angle of advance is around 30 degrees, and in the right-hand picture, the angle has been flattened out significantly. Notice how the steeper angle is far less forgiving, and any extra insertion at this point will likely lead to the cannula puncturing through the far wall of the vein. The same cannula flattened out significantly on the right still has some room to advance and is less likely to contact the back wall of the vessel. This is a particular issue as cannulas are specifically designed to cut downwards with little resistance. Conversely, it's extremely difficult to breach the upper vessel wall with the back side of a cannula if you flatten out, and you can even manipulate the position of the vessel in soft tissues using the upper side of the cannula without causing trauma to allow you to be certain you've advanced far enough to safely withdraw your needle. That concept is well displayed in this video of a large cannula being inserted. Notice how once first flashback has been obtained, the cannula is flattened significantly, even as far as picking up the vein and skin with the back surface of the cannula without causing any trauma and allowing the cannula to be threaded off the introducer. There are many correct ways to hold a cannula and no doubt everyone will have adapted and developed their own technique. But I'm going to advocate for a cannula grip 
which I believe is optimal. This is the grip whereby you place your thumb and middle finger on either side of a flashback chamber and use them to control your angle and needle insertion into the vein. This leaves your index finger free to advance the cannula off the needle and your ring and little fingers free to steady your hand against the patient. There are several reasons why I believe this grip in particular is optimal. It doesn't rely on optional cannula features such as wings or IV ports, so you can use it with every cannula. It allows a full view of the flashback chamber at all times, so you'll know the second you get first flashback. It's a one-handed technique, keeping the other hand available for maintaining skin tension, keeping the patient steady, grabbing things, or the most useful one for me personally, holding an ultrasound probe. I found my natural cannula grip unsuitable when I started doing a lot of ultrasound guided access, and so I've had to adapt to using this new grip. Finally, the grip allows for a very controlled insertion as your hand is braced against the patient. There's no need to let go of the cannula at any point, and you have a hand free to keep and maintain skin tension throughout the procedure. I believe there are only three real ways to fail a cannula, which can be helpful to analyse why cannula attempts may have been unsuccessful and allow for properly informed technique adjustments to overcome them. The first and simplest way of failing is where you simply don't get access to a vessel at any point. It's probably the most straightforward failure to troubleshoot as the vessel won't have been traumatised. Don't fish around too much, just remove the cannula Get set up again and take your time to make sure you're properly aligned with an appropriate vessel. Proper lighting, patient preparation and positioning, cannula grip, skin tension and advancing slowly can all minimise chances of outright missing a vessel. Advancing too far refers to a situation where you, you were in a vessel at some point and you've had your first flashback. But either you weren't quite square and glanced through the side of the vessel or you advance too far and pierce the back wall of the vessel. This can be a big issue to fix, as the vein is now traumatised. You can attempt to pull back and re-angle into the vein, but often if you find yourself in this situation, the best thing to do is abandon the current attempt. Minimising the chances of this occurring is an extension of everything we've covered so far. If you spend a good amount of time preparing and selecting your vein, and manage to maintain skin tension, you should have no issues introducing your introducer centrally within a vein. After which, it's simply a case of not advancing too far and piercing the back wall. If you're using the suggested grip and advancing slowly whilst paying attention, you should see the instant your cannula pierces the front wall of the vessel. It's then a case of ensuring your angle is shallow and advancing by at least the distance from the needle tip to the cannula tubing plus a couple of millimetres to allow for the thickness of the vessel before finally threading your cannula off the needle and into the vein. Just as it's possible to advance the cannula too far, it's of course also possible to not advance the cannula far enough. In this situation, despite having had first flashback, if you try to advance the cannula tubing off the introducer needle, you'll simply be bouncing it off the near wall of the vein. This is redeemable, by simply ensuring that after your first flashback, you advance at least the distance from the needle tip to the tubing, which you will remember is significantly different depending on your cannula gauge, plus a couple of millimetres to allow for the vessel wall thickness. I believe there are some reasons people often cite for failing cannulas, which are less relevant in practice. Hitting a valve is a common scapegoat excuse, which is least relevant as a cannula, which was never in a vein in the first place, can't be blocked by a valve. It's certainly worth being aware of valves and the fact that they occasionally block you from advancing your cannula. If you have performed every step correctly and you are sure you're in a vein but struggling to advance, then you're most likely against a valve. I wouldn't recommend advancing through it with a needle, as this can traumatise the vein. You can consider simply withdrawing your needle and leaving some of the cannula tube hanging outside the skin, which will allow temporary use of the cannula. 
If this isn't an option for you, then remove the needle, attach a saline flush, and attempt to simultaneously flush and advance the cannula tubing without the needle in situ. Just be aware that this technique can be hit and miss. Vasospasm. Now this isn't common during peripheral IV cannulation and shouldn't be a big issue provided you're in the vein in the first place. If a vein that was previously looking like a good target disappears, I think the more likely scenario is overinsertion leading to trauma. The patient has bad veins is something I hear said far more than I think it should be. While some patients are more challenging to cannulate, cannulate for a variety of reasons, I don't feel blaming them or their veins for failed cannula attempts is helpful rhetoric. Being confident in your own IV cannulation skills should include optimising your IV access strategy for the patient's individual needs. Which brings me on to my final point, and in my opinion, one of the more difficult nuances of IV cannulation, which is knowing when to quit. Too often I see people having multiple attempts which were doomed before they started. In my opinion, if you're confident in your abilities and have taken your time to thoroughly assess a patient's veins, it's perfectly reasonable to go straight to a different form of access. And don't let anyone tell you anything arbitrary along the lines of, you need to have had at least three goes before calling for backup. Though of course, this is always your own clinical judgment call. And don't forget, a more experienced cannulator can often see things or access veins which you wouldn't be able to. You always have other access options, whether it's reaching for the ultrasound machine, scheduling a midline, or even in emergency situations where it's often quicker to reach for the intraosseous access than it is to waste time and delay resuscitation with multiple cannula attempts in an already chaotic scenario with a peripherally shut down patient. A quick recap then. We've covered the anatomy of the cannula and its relevance to your technique. Some technique tips, including skin tension, cannula grip and insertion angle. The three ways to fail a cannula. And when to stop or consider alternatives to a cannula. Credit for some of the video clips and images shown throughout the presentation goes to ABCs of Anesthesia, Medicine in a Nutshell, and Aman Cholera of YouTube. The ABCs of Anesthesia channel in particular is worth looking at for deep dives into cannulation technique and high quality real patient videos. Thank you for watching and thank you to Sean and the rest of the Difficult Vascular Access in Children faculty.